Let's stand together as we read God's Word together, as God's Word instructs us on who He is, and we proclaim and lift up who He is in song. Shall we read together? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Shall we sing together? All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord. and crown him Lord of all. Yes, he ought and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the Everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Crown him. King. 
of the Lord, wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Emmanuel, God is with us, and He shall reign, He shall reign, He shall reign forevermore. Make that your prayer, your testimony. Crown him king of kings. Crown him king of kings. Crown him Lord of lords. Wonderful counselor, the mighty to God on our behalf. And then after I pray, I want you to speak to one another, give each other a hug or a handshake and welcome this to this welcome each other to this worship service today. First, let's talk to God. Now, Father, as we have sung these praises, we have been brought into your presence and we are so grateful for your Holy Spirit who makes us aware of the fact that you were here before we got here. And we're grateful that we've been brought into your presence through this singing and through the kinds of things that have made us sensitive to the fact that you are indeed here. Now, Father, I pray that you will guide us through this worship service. Thank you for Ed and his leadership and for the other worship leaders who will come in due time to guide us to the place where we hear your word preached and where we can respond. Help us today to listen. Help us to respond to what you want us to do. And we will give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Now greet one another. Hug one another. Give each other a handshake. Now I want to tell you about our speaker today. He is uh, invited to give the Gurney Lectures uh, this year. The Gurney Lectures are, uh, have been set aside to focus attention on evangelism 
And we always try to invite someone who is an outstanding Christian leader. And our guest uh, preacher certainly fits that bill. Uh, he was saved when he was 12 years old in North Carolina, Labor Day, 1969. He says his testimony received Christ Jesus into his heart at a Gideon retreat and uh, came to know Christ. Then later on, God called him to preach, and uh, he uh, went to Furman University in 1976 and began to prepare for ministry. Along the way, God brought him a, a, a bride who uh, has been walking with him for uh, since 1979, and together they have three children. One's 19, one is 18, and one is 14. The two older children are in college at Dallas Baptist uh, University on scholarship. And the youngest child, yeah, we heard the amen in the background. Anybody who knows what it's like uh, to, to suffer from uh, you know, maltuition, we, we know the pain that he endures. The youngest child is a student at uh, the First Baptist Church Dallas uh, Academy there. 1999, God called him to be the pastor of First Baptist Church, Dallas, after a very effective ministry in High Point, North Carolina, president of the North uh, Carolina Baptist uh, Convention. God uh, uh, moved him to First Baptist, Dallas, and you know that church. is a great flagship church for the Southern Baptist Convention for one generation after the next. And our guest preacher is guiding that church, leading that congregation to make a 21st century kind of a difference through that flagship church. We are glad that he is at the helm and we are glad that he's come to speak to us today. His name is Mac Brunson, and we're glad to have Dr. Brunson to come and speak to us from God's Word in this lecture series. We're going to continue to worship. Uh, Ed is going to lead us as we sing, and after uh, a musical contribution, we're going to ask Dr. Brunson to come and speak what God has laid on his heart. Amen. Exalting Christ, in part, is a matter of perspective. As we gain perspective of who He is, we gain perspective of who we are. Let's stand together as we sing, He is exalted. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. The Lord forever is full shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever is true, shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. In awesome wonder, consider all the world thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim like God how great thou art then 
sings my soul, my Savior called to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior called to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. God's Word in the image of man, all to show me that grace, faith, and mercy was the mystery and wonder of eternity's plan. And then he carried my sin on to Calvary. And truly having no guilt of his own, he was nailed to a cross of my making. Yet he used it to bridge o'er the void to God's throne. No wonder they call him Savior. No wonder they call him Lord. Jesus. God's choice, His favor, cost more than this world could ever afford. He ransomed His life for my pardon. Sin's price paid in full, not in part. No wonder they call Him Savior. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Him Jesus, the Lamb of God. I wasn't there when the earth was created, so I've no proof. That he hung every star But I know what my life was without him And the joy that was mine When he rescued my heart No wonder they call him Savior. No wonder they call him Lord. Jesus, 
Jesus, God's joy, His favor, costs more than His world could ever afford. He ransomed His life for my pardon. Sin's price paid in full, not in part. No wonder they call Him Savior. Jesus, the Lamb of God. It's good to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and I want to thank Dr. Kelly for allowing me to be here at the Gurney Lectures when I was in college and seminary. Whenever they'd have a lecture series, they'd normally bring in somebody that uh, no one could understand unless they were in the philosophy department, and uh, I'll, uh, I, I, I certainly won't fit into that category, that's for sure, but I do appreciate the opportunity to be with you and uh, to be in New Orleans, uh, where I can get some Cajun cooking, just a little bit of it anyway. And I hope you guys are happier than y'all look, are you? Amen? Huh? Y'all all right? You awake this morning? In fact, I'm going to start off just telling you a story. I don't know if uh, the people are related to the ones who set up uh, the lecture series, but I want to start with a story about a lady by the name of Bridget Gurney who uh, lived in New York City and was on her way to work just a few years ago. And on her way to work, the unbelievable happened. The incredible took place. There was, on top of one of those skyscrapers, one of these cranes that they put on top to continue building up a building. The thing toppled and fell and crashed to the ground and fell right on top of this lady whose name was Bridget Gurney. And the amazing thing is, is that it did not kill her. It pinned her to the city street for about six hours. They had rescue workers there. They had medical personnel. They had firemen. They had police. They had engineers. They had construction workers there, all trying to get this massive piece of steel off of this one little lady who was pinned to the street uh, there in New York City. And, uh, And during that six hours, there was one guy, a construction worker by the name of Paul Raganese, who came up sat down beside her and reached out and simply took her hand and held her hand through those six hours. Well, eventually they got the crane off of her, put her in an ambulance, took her off to the hospital where she was uh, taken, of course, to the emergency room, underwent numerous surgeries over the next four, five, six weeks. And when she was released, a, a television station there in New York to do a human interest story went down to the hospital as she was uh, being released and asked her, what was it that pulled you through this incredible event? How in the world did you survive this? What was it that that, uh, just gave you the will to live? And this is what Bridget Gurney said. She said, that man sitting there holding my hand gave me the will to live. He made the difference in my life. Now, there is something about the human touch. There's something about reaching out and touching other people. In fact, there have been all kinds of studies that have been done on that. There have been studies in the medical field that show that the human touch can raise uh, the hemoglobin and lower blood pressure. There have been studies done in uh, schools on how students do better when teachers go by and uh, just give them a pat on the back. There have been studies in 
the sports world, how sports teams uh, do better when the coaches give them uh, that extra touch, that extra pat. They put their hands on their back and just kind of give them a pat. In fact, they got that down to a percentage. Those sports teams that win are touched six times more often than those sports teams who lose. That's why at the Dallas Cowboys, we're hiring Benny Hinn to come as head football coach. Somebody needs to touch him, that's for sure. There's just something about the human touch. And listen, let me tell you, nobody touched humanity like Jesus Christ. And if you've got a copy of God's Word, if you're at seminary and you don't, uh, we probably need to talk afterwards. But I want you to take your copy of God's Word, and I want you to look with me this morning at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. When you come to Mark chapter 5, you come to what has been called the chapter of the incurables. You've got the Gadarene demoniac, and you ask the question, well, do you really believe in demon possession? Let me tell you something. I've been around enough Baptists to know it's so. That's the only way I know to describe some people. Yes, I believe in demon possession. You come to the, to the Gadarene demoniac. Listen, he was not just, uh, he was not just ill. He was possessed. You come to the woman with the issue of blood, and then you come uh, to Jairus' daughter. And that's what I want to kind of focus on for the next couple of minutes. Uh, You see the power of Christ, how He doesn't, listen, He doesn't just uh, pass by these situations. He walks into the midst of the lives of each one of these people, and He touches their lives. And and, and let me tell you, he uh, He doesn't just do it in passing. He changes their lives for all of eternity. Now, if we came upon the Gadarene demoniac, we'd probably tell him what you need is a psychiatrist, you need some Prozac, you need some lithium, you need something. That's what we would say. You come uh, across, uh, you come across the woman with the issue of blood, we would say what you need is an oncologist. You come to Jairus, and we would say what you need is a funeral director. But Jesus Christ walked into each one of those situations and touched those people and uh, change not only their life, but change their eternity. And in fact, you see the power of God. You can go back to chapter 4, where you see uh, Jesus as He calms the storm, and you see His power over the natural. You come to the Gadarene demoniac, and you see His power over the supernatural. You come to the woman with the issue of blood, and you see His power over the physical. You come to uh, Jairus' daughter, and you see His power over the eternal. In each one of these situations, Jesus reaches out... And he touches people and he changes their lives and he has an impact on their eternity. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ is called every one of us sitting in here today to do. And that is to reach out, touch a hurting humanity, and touch their lives so that Christ can change not only their lives, but their eternities. Amen? Y'all know how to say amen? Amen. Well, if you've got a copy of God's Word, I want to show you how we're to do that. So pick it up in Mark chapter 5. How are we to touch hurting people? If we're going to touch people that are hurting, we're going to touch people and we're going to have an impact on this world through our churches, as we lead our churches, If while we do evangelism, there are several things that we're going to have to do that are so evident in this passage. Number one, we're going to have to overcome certain barriers if we're going to touch people's lives. Pick it up in verse 21 of Mark chapter 5. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered about him, and he stayed by the seashore. Now, when you begin to read this section, you see all of these barriers that are implicit. They are implied in the text. You see a number of barriers that are going to have to be crossed here. The first barrier that's going to have to be crossed uh, in order to touch someone, to to make an impact on their lives, and uh, to touch them for eternity, the first barrier that's going to have to be crossed is this barrier of tradition, uh, of position. Now look at it with me, beginning in verse 22. And the synagogue official. Now, right there you see the position the synagogue official named Jairus. Now, he was the official in the area that he lived, and in that day and time, it meant so much more than that he was just, uh, that he was just the preacher. It, it meant that he was 
not only the leader of the synagogue, he was not only the leader in that community, he was essentially the mayor, the city manager, the judge, the jury. He was everything. And as an official in the synagogue there, he was part of that group already who were resolute in their opposition to Jesus Christ. Everything about Jesus was uh, was a resentment to Jairus. Uh, they were already plotting, what are we going to do with this rebel rabbi? What are we going to do with this Jesus? He, he won't come over and fit into our form. He won't act like the rest of us uh, religious leaders. And so what are we going to do with him? So everything about Jesus, Jairus was totally against. This synagogue official had to get over this position, and one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, came up and upon seeing him fell at his feet and entreated him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. Now let me tell you something, folks. There is one thing for sure. When God wants to get your attention, He knows how to do it. God doesn't have any problem getting a hold of your attention when He deems it necessary. And this uh, synagogue official, this man who thought that probably his relationship with God prevented anything from happening to him or his family, came to the place where he understood that what he needed was a touch from the Master. What he needed was an encounter with Jesus Christ. And he had to step over that barrier of position in order to get to the place where Christ could touch his life and the life of his little girl and the life of his family. Now, I want to tell you, if you're going to touch people for Christ, uh, there are barriers that you're going to have to get over. And one of the great barriers that I see is, since I'm a Baptist and I'm a pastor and that's my world and that's what I know, there is this great barrier of position at least in our minds, that we're going to have to get over if we're going to touch people for Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you what is really on my heart about this. I have, uh, I see and am troubled so about so many men in the ministry who, who, who approach it as a perfection. Now I want to tell you something. I don't have a profession. I have a calling on my life. And there is a vast difference between the two. If you're looking for a profession, you need to get in a law school somewhere, or you need to get in pharmacy school somewhere, or you need to go somewhere else. But if you're not here because God called you, then you're here for the wrong reason. And I watch men go in the ministry today who are more interested in how they look and how they dress and that they are considered to be the CEO of some kind of corporation or the president of some company, they're more concerned about that than they are in doing ministry. And I'm afraid that those of us in the mega church have absolutely, practically ruined an entire generation making you think that you've got to dress for success and talk like success and seek success in order to be successful. We've got to get over this thing. I have men call me every week and say, will you recommend me? Will you recommend me? And I don't have a problem recommending somebody if I know them and I'm comfortable with doing that. And I want you to listen to what they ask me to do. Will you recommend me to a mega church? And they say, I believe God's called me to a, to a mega church. And I said, is that right? When did God reveal that to you? Uh, what, and they, and they want to know, well, well, how can I get a mega church? I said, I have no idea how you get a mega church. I don't know how you get a mega church. I wasn't looking for a mega church when a mega church came along. Wasn't my desire to be in a mega church. But I want to tell you something. We have built a mindset, and I guess the best place to start this is with those of you in seminary. If you're going to touch people for the cause of Jesus Christ, get over this concept that I have got to have this great position in order to do anything in the kingdom of God. Are you all awake? Amen? Huh? You okay? I see so many preachers in this day and time who look uh, like they've stepped out of a GQ magazine and they've got so much moose in their hair, I expect them to sprout antlers any day. Now let me tell you why we do that. We do that because we fear failure. 
We're terrified of failure. I was just in one of the pastoral ministries classes, and I made this comment in there. Preachers are insecure. Now, you, you can sit there and smile and say, not me. Listen, if, if you're in the ministry, most of us, the ones that I know, suffer a great deal from insecurity. We are terrified we're going to fail in front of the world. When First Baptist Church of Dallas called me to come to be their pastor, I'll be honest with you, I really did not expect that I would last at First Dallas a year. I mean, I went to a church that was considered to be the most difficult church to go into, probably in all of Christendom. They were taking odds on me in Las Vegas, how long I was going to make it. Uh, and uh, when I went there, I just went there with the understanding. I didn't know why. It was not something I wanted to do. I, I could not understand it. And, uh, and I really expected to go there and to fail and to be fired within inside of a year or to have to leave. I don't think they'd fire anybody, but to have to leave inside of a year. And I want to tell you, that was my heart. You say, oh, well, why did you think that? Well, I don't have time to go into all that, but, but let me tell you, that was in my heart. That was the way I felt. And I had to deal with this issue in my life. Do I want to be successful in the eyes of man, or do I want to be successful in the eyes of God? And I had to come to the conclusion that I had rather fail in the eyes of man, now listen, than be successful in those things that don't matter to God. We've got to get over this barrier of position. Y'all may not like that or amen it, but that's all right. Secondly, let me tell you, we've got to get over this barrier of tradition. Now, it's implied in the text, the whole chapter. Everything Jesus does in Mark chapter 5 kind of uh, flies in the face of Jewish tradition. Going over to Gadara, no rabbi would have done that. That's where Gentiles were. There was a cemetery there. That would make them ceremonially unclean. Uh, There was the Gadarene demoniac. No rabbi would have sat down and had a conversation with him or gotten around him uh, because uh, that would have made him ceremonially unclean. Uh, This woman with the issue of blood, uh, now she she touched the hem of his garment. But let me tell you something. Jesus knew exactly what was coming. Jesus knew who she was, what the situation was. Even though he turns around and wants to know, he wants her to identify herself Have y'all heard this new thing in theology, I'm sure some of the professors have, uh, that's going around, and uh, I'll not use any names, who essentially say, some theologians say, that God doesn't know certain things until they happen. Have y'all heard that? Well, don't worry about it. It's out of hell anyway. So, uh, uh, Jesus knew exactly who she was, exactly what was coming, and... uh, uh, she touches him. Now listen, no Jewish rabbi would have ever let a woman with an issue of blood. In fact, the book of Leviticus says she should have been put outside the camp of Israel. She comes up and touches him. That would have made him ceremonially unclean. Jesus turns around and talks to the woman. No rabbi would have done that in Jesus' day. I mean, that was taboo. You didn't talk to a woman in public. Uh, the, the, the little child, Jairus' daughter, Jesus walks into the room, takes her by the hand, Uh, That flies in the face of Jewish tradition. That would have made him ceremonially unclean. Everything that Jesus does in Mark chapter 5 flies in the face of Jewish tradition. Now, that's interesting to me. And it says to me that if we're going to touch people for the cause of Jesus Christ, that there are some things that we're going to have to get over. There are some traditions that we're going to have to get by. Now, you're another generation coming out of this school. And I don't know all the traditions that you're going to face in the churches that God's going to call you to and the ministries that God's going to call you to. But listen, let me tell you something. We are still going to have to get over this tradition, uh, uh, these traditions of, of race, of culture, socially. Listen, musically, we started a 930 service at First Dallas. Uh, October was a year ago. We have an 8 o'clock service that was essentially 70, 75% full. Uh, We have 11 o'clock service that is about 100% full, and so we have no place to grow, and so we started a 9.30 service. Um, And uh, we started a contemporary service simply because we couldn't run a choir orchestra, choir orchestra, choir orchestra. 
So we put in some uh, uh, a praise band and some singers, and we started off with about 250. October was a year ago. This past Sunday, we had probably 700 uh, in there. We're seeing folks saved in that service every single week. We have uh, every week at First Dallas, we're seeing African Americans come and join the church. Hispanics come and join the church. Asians come and join the church. Uh, Anglos come and join the church. Uh, we're trying in every way we can to overcome some of these barriers. And these are barriers that you're going to face. Now, I want to show you something very quickly. Just put your finger there in Mark chapter 5. Look over just a, a chapter or two to Mark chapter 7. This is a great verse right here. This will be beneficial to you one day in the ministry, in the right place. Verse 5, And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not uh, walk according to the tradition of the elders? I love this. But eat their bread with impure hands. They didn't wash their hands. Now listen to what Jesus said in verse 8. Why do you neglect the commandment of God and hold to your tradition? <laughs> oh, isn't that good? Mark it down. You'll use it one day. There'll be a deacon you can quote this to. He was also saying to them, you nicely set aside the commandment of, of God in order to keep your tradition. There's some barriers of tradition we're going to have to get over. Do you know the biggest tradition I've had to get over at First Dallas? RAs and GAs. <laughs> you cannot imagine when I said we need to initiate an Awanas program here in the church. And uh, we're going to need to do it when RAs and GAs uh, is taught. Now, I, I, you know, I don't know if I've made enemies already, but I want to tell you what, it's been going now since January. We started it in January. I had to hold meetings. I had to hold hands. I had to sit down and listen. I had to read letters. You cannot imagine all that I had to do to say, let's just give RAs and GAs a good send-off and let's have an Awanas program where over the last two months we have seen scores of children come to Jesus Christ. There are some traditions that if you want to touch lives, you're going to have to get over. Number three, some barriers. And the third barrier is the barrier of interruption. Now, did you pick that up when you read Mark chapter 5? You know, everything in Mark chapter 5 is an interruption. Everything that takes place in Mark chapter 5 is an interruption. Uh, the Gadarene demoniac, Jesus was trying to get away so he could get to the other side to rest. He'd been teaching, and uh, he gets to the other side, and there's this Gadarene demoniac running and screaming at him. I'd call that a slight interruption. Uh, he gets the guy taken care of, and then the town people come out and tell him to leave. They want him to get out of there. That's an interruption. He gets back to the other side, and uh, there is a crowd. He gets out of the boat, and the multitude, verse 21, this great multitude is, is still gathered there waiting for him, and he steps out, and uh, that's an interruption. Jairus comes up to him. That's an interruption. He goes with Jairus, and this woman comes up behind him and touches him, the hem of his garment. That's an interruption. Everything in Mark chapter 5 is an interruption. Now, you stop and think about that. The whole ministry of Christ, it seems like, was carried out in the midst of interruption. Jesus is on His way to Jerusalem. There's blind Bartimaeus crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. That's an interruption. Jesus is walking through Jericho. There's Zacchaeus up a tree out on a limb. That's an interruption. He's trying to eat supper. The Syrophoenician woman is begging Him to do something about her child. That's an interruption. The whole ministry of Jesus is carried out, it seems to me, in the midst of one interruption after another. Now, when I have a bad day, how do I describe a bad day? I had one interruption after another. When I sit down to study, I want to study. I don't want the phone to ring. Uh, I, I haven't figured it out yet. Do you all have that email that when, when you get a piece of email, something dings and it just kind of pops up? I hate that thing. It's an interruption. I'm sitting there working on something, and uh, and it just there's a ding, and you know you got a piece of mail. Somebody knocks at the door. Somebody comes in. You've got to go to the hospital. You've got to rush off and do this. All of these things, interruption after interruption after interruption. And I don't like interruptions. I was on my way back to Dallas 
uh, I had been back in North Carolina and was flying back, and Debbie and I were on an airplane uh, that had three seats on one side, and I don't know what it was, three seats on the other, and Debbie was stuck in the middle. There was a nice lady sitting by the window, and I was sitting in the aisle seat, and I wanted to finish this book by the time I got to Dallas, uh, because I knew once I got back, I, I, it would be difficult to finish it up. So I was intent on finishing the book. Debbie, about halfway through the flight, says, now, okay, I've served my time in this seat. You get up and you sit here. So uh, I got up and I did what I was told to do. I got up and I sat down uh, in the seat. And uh, the lady next to me looks over and she says, uh, what are you reading? And uh, I don't know what I told her. I said a book, I guess. I don't, I don't know what I said, but I said something thinking, you know, she would pick up that I really didn't want to talk. And uh, then right on the heels of that, she said, well, what do you do? Now, I'm not always comfortable just telling everybody I'm a Baptist preacher because sometimes you get fired at pretty good with that. And uh, I think I told her, I said, uh, I'm in the life assurance business. Anybody, you got any life assurance? And the lady said, oh, yeah, I got it through the company. I said, no, 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 not life insurance, life assurance. Do you have life assurance? She said, well, I don't know what life assurance is. I said, let me share with you what life assurance is, and I shared with her Jesus Christ. And at the end of that, she uh, shared with me how years earlier she had given her life to Christ, but she had backslid, and she was out of God's will for her life and out of church. And I thought, well, now, Lord, I've done what I needed to do. I did what you wanted me to do. I shared with her and uh, and prayed with her to get back uh, to where she needed to be spiritually, and I can finish the book. Then the lady looks at me and she says, will you teach me how to do what you just did? And I said, what do you you mean? She says, I've got a friend that needs Jesus. Will you teach me how to tell her how to invite Jesus into her life? And so I went through CWTEE and faith real quick, all all of those all at once. And and, uh, I was coming back because we we were getting ready to go to Ukraine. We... Uh, take a group. We've got a big group that's leaving in, in May. We leave uh, Thursday. We leave Thursday for England. And uh, I've got a large group going in May to uh, Ukraine. We do medical missions and evangelism and, and things like that. And, and I had been planning that trip and working on that trip and needed, uh, uh, needed medications and things like that to go over there for the doctors to use. And uh, as the flight ended, I thought, well, I didn't get finished with my book. You know, I'm not just this interruption. This lady reaches down and pulls out a business card. And she hands me her business card, and she says, I am vice president of one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in America. And if you need any medical supplies for your mission trips, all you got to do is call me. And I sat there stunned. I took the card and looked at it. And God spoke to my heart, and He said, if you'll let me interrupt you once in a while, I'll get something done. (laughs) Now, if we're going to touch a hurting world, we're going to have to overcome some of these barriers. Those barriers of position, those barriers of tradition, those barriers of interruption. Now, that's point one. I've got just a few minutes to give you the other two points. Secondly, We're going to have to overcome certain barriers, but secondly, we're going to have to overcome a fickle faith. Now look with me. Jesus now is talking to this woman who touched Him. You're going to have to pick it up in verse 35, because there's that interruption now, this woman who has the issue of blood. And while Jesus is talking with the woman with the issue of blood, verse 35, while He was still speaking, that is, while Jesus was still speaking to her, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Now, I don't know if that hits you like it hits me. But he essentially says, you just figure Jesus out of the situation. It's dead, so just forget it. Your daughter's dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. Your marriage is dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. Your church is dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. Your relationship with your children or your parents, it's dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. The denomination is dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. Now, let me tell you something. You figure Jesus out of the equation, and if it's dead, it is hopeless. 
But I don't care if it's dead. When you figure Jesus into the equation, He specializes in resurrections. So they're speaking to Jairus, and they said, listen, your daughter's dead, don't bother. But now look at, look at verse 36. But Jesus parakuo, this is an interesting word. Paraz, the prefix, akuo, is the word uh, for acoustics. It is the word to hear, to hear alongside. It is uh, the way I translate it, to hear alongside. He could hear these guys talking, but his mind was concentrating on something else. It's kind of like when you preach. Uh, they can hear something going on, but they're concentrating on something else, right? How many of you I get? Gotcha. All looking up right now. They, they hear something going on, you know, over here, but uh, they, they're focused. He's focused on something else. And he looks, he looks at uh, Jairus and he says to him, he says, Do not be afraid. Phobeomai. It is the present imperative. It is a command. It means to stop an action in the process. You stop being afraid. Only pistuo. Believe. Another present imperative. Another command. You believe. In other words, he says, stop fearing, stop doubting. You've already allowed this doubt to come in your mind. You stop the doubting. Faith it. Faith it. Now, let me tell you something, folks, young people. There's going to be all kinds of voices that are going to be calling out to you. Voices of distraction. Voices of detraction. Uh, voices that are going to call for you to do this and call for you to do that. Let me tell you, when you get out into ministry, there are going to be a thousand, thousand voices out there calling for you to do this, follow their agenda, get on their program, support their ministry, give to this, to do that, to do the other. There are going to be a thousand voices that are going to call for you to do that. You'd better be sure that the one voice you listen to is Jesus Christ. You'd better focus on that. See, he had this faith. He was up. He was following Christ. Now that faith is gone. And Jesus looks at him and says, look, you stop doubting. Don't do that. Well, they continued on. Let me hurry on through this. They come down to uh, his house. Uh, verse uh, 39, and entering in, he said to them, they had this whole great big group of uh, people down there that were mourning and crying and uh, weeping and wailing, and uh, any any Jew would have had a flute player and one professional mourner. And Jairus was a wealthy man. He had he had a whole production company down there. And entering in, Jesus said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. And they began to laugh at him. Uh, they laughed at him. These weeping mourners now become laughing scorners. Now, I love this next part of this verse. But, and it refers to Jesus, but putting them all out. Now, I wonder how he did that. You ever wonder about Scripture, stuff like that? I wonder if he just opened the door and he said, you know, hey, don't call us, we'll call you. Just this way, whatever. Now, you, you have to ask, why did Jesus do that? You know, in my mind, if I'm going to, if I'm going to raise that child, if I'm going to resuscitate that child, I'd leave them all in there, do it, and look at them and say, now laugh now. Now that's the flesh. That's what I would have done. Jesus put them out. Let me tell you why He put them out. Because they had already determined what God could and could not do. Now there's some of y'all sitting here this morning, that's exactly where you are. In your life, you've already made up your mind what God can and cannot do. And you're limiting God. And you're limiting what God wants to do with you and through you. And you're going to have to overcome this fickle faith that's up one day and down the next day and has already determined what God can do in your life. Let me show you in just a couple of minutes this last thing. You're going to have to overcome some barriers. You're going to have to overcome this fickle faith. But now, number three, look at this. You're going to have to submit to the overcomer. Jesus takes mom and dad and uh, Peter, James, and John into the room. Verse 41, And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talithe kum, 
which translated means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl rose and began to walk, for she was twelve years of age. And immediately they were completely astounded. Now let me tell you something. What you see right there in the text is the power of God. You've seen that in this whole chapter. You've seen the power of Jesus Christ over the supernatural, over the physical, over the natural. Now you come and you see it over the eternal. He takes that little girl by the hand and he resuscitates her. He brings her back to life. It's not so much his word as it is who's speaking the word. It's not the magnitude of his voice. It's the majesty of his personhood. If uh, the Gospel of Mark is the preaching of Peter, I can almost just imagine Peter under inspiration preaching and telling this story and Mark under inspiration writing this down. And Peter comes to that place where he says, and he spoke to the little girl, taking her by the hand. He spoke to her and she arose. And I almost wonder if Mark didn't say, hey, Peter, what did he say? And Peter, because Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit would bring back all these things that he had said, remember that? Remembers correctly, exactly, infallibly, he remembers, he said, Talithe kum, which means, I say to thee, little girl, arise. Now that is the power you and I have got to tap into if we're going to touch a hurting world for Jesus Christ. Back in October of 1997, David Huxley in Australia, I sat beside a guy from Australia flying down here yesterday, shared Christ with him. He too was out of church, said that he had accepted Christ. I talked to him about his relationship to the Lord. But in 1997, in October, a guy by the name of David Huxley did the incredible. He put on a vest to which was attached a steel cable, 15 feet in length. The cable was attached to that vest, and the other end of it was attached to the front struts of a 747 that weighs 187 tons. And standing flat-footed, David Huxley began to began to strain and pull, and he pulled that 187 ton, 747, a hundred yards in a minute and 27 seconds. Now, can you imagine that? He pulled that jet. Straining, can't you imagine just seeing that? When I read that story, I thought to myself, that is absolutely incredible. How this guy could pull a jet that weighs that much. But then I thought to myself, you know what? One man could step on that plane and flip a switch and that thing could take off out of there at about 600 miles an hour and fly at about 40,000 feet in the air. Now that's real power. Just to flip that switch and to make that thing fly. And here we are every single day living the Christian life in our power. And we get up and we suit up and we strain and we pull and we tug and we work and we labor and we huff and we puff. And listen, we exasperate ourselves and we exasperate our families and we exasperate our congregations. And here we are straining to pull this thing. And Jesus says, if you'll let me in the driver's seat, I can make this thing fly. And if we're going to touch a hurting world, for Jesus Christ. We're going to have to submit to His power and be done with ours. Would you stand with me? Would you just stand and bow your heads for just a moment? I don't know what God's saying to you this morning. Maybe there's some of you here, there's some barriers that you're going to have to get over. Maybe that's what the Lord's talking to you about. Maybe the Lord's talking to you about overcoming this this faith that's up and down and in and out. And one day you're this, and one day you're not. Listen, James talks about that, about being a double-minded man. He says when you pray, 
You go through testing times. You let it have its perfect work in you. Because it's going to mature you. It's going to make you mature. You endure that. It brings about in, uh, about a maturity in your life. And to make it through that, you pray for godly wisdom. And he says when you pray for that, you don't waver. You don't doubt. Let me tell you something. God is not only able to accomplish in your life what He wants to accomplish. He is willing to do it as well. Maybe this morning you've got to overcome this, this faith that's it's here and it's gone and it's back and then it's gone again. Maybe some of you this morning, you're, you're doing that. Maybe in your marriage, maybe in your studies, maybe in the church that you're in, maybe the faculty and staff, you, you find yourself in that same situation. You're straining and you're frustrated and you're pulling and you've done everything you need to do. And the Lord says, listen, would you submit to my power? It's not your power, it's my power. We need to say with Paul, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It is Christ living in me. Father, right now, You know the struggle on every single heart. You know the difficulty. Father, we need to be far more effective as believers than we are. We need to be far more effective witnesses than we are. We need to be far more effective in our churches And Lord, it's because we've allowed barriers to stand in our way and it's because we don't have uh, the kind of faith that You you call us to have. And Lord, because we try to do so much of this in our own strength, in our own ability. Father, we need to come and just say, forgive us. We repent of that. We need to turn from that. We need to commit ourselves, Lord Jesus, to submitting to Your power and to following your example, to reach out and touch a hurting world for the cause of Jesus Christ. I pray for all of these that are gathered here today, from faculty and staff to these students, that, Lord God, that today they would sense your presence and your nearness. And I pray, Father, that they have met this morning the Master in the text. For I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.